welcome back to Cuckoo for Books. My name is Salva and today I'm going to be doing a book review on The Bone Witch by Rin Chapeco. I've heard nothing but praise about this series, so I decided to jump right in and see what all the fuss was about. So The Bone Witch is a fantasy novel. It's been a while since I was able to immerse myself into a brand new fantasy world. I've been reading spin-offs or sequels of fantasy books for maybe the past half a year, and this was such a breath of fresh air. I love the diversity of the characters. Honestly, the world is really unlike any you've seen in a fantasy book. There really isn't a real-life counterpart for each kingdom. The story revolves around a girl named Taya, who, when she was a child, finds out she can raise the dead. In this universe, there are these people called the Asha. If you're a regular Asha, you can control things like the elements, earth, wind, water, fire, all that fun stuff. But there is a subset of Asha called the Dark Asha, and they can only control the dark, but more specifically, the dead. So they're basically necromancers. What happens is because it's such an unnatural magic, they're treated like pariahs of the world. So Taya, our protagonist, finds out that she is one such Dark Asha, and this is sort of her coming of age story where she goes into training and learns about the world because she grew up in like a small village so this is really her meeting the rest of the world and the rest of the world meeting Taya. So the way the story is told it switches back and forth between present day Taya and Taya when she just found out she was a necromancer. At the beginning you already know that Taya is in exile and it was one of the most epic starts to a story ever. The beginning of the story was so well written. It captured your attention right away. You're like, what is going on? I'm invested. I do not know what is going on, but I am in. The author did such an amazing job of laying down the groundwork. There are some fantasy stories, you're three chapters in and you're like, I still don't know what's going on. But in the prologue, I was like, okay, got it. This is where we are. Let's go. I really like the concept of switching back and forth between Taya and Exile and Taya just finding out her powers for the first time. But there was a part of me that also wished that it didn't happen every chapter. Like just when I was getting invested into Exile Taya's story, we'd be like whisked back in time and then while we were getting to know child Taya or preteen Taya, learning her powers and going through training, it's like oh, we fast forward in time and go back to Exiled her. I think it would have been more effective for me at least if it had been once every three chapters, once every five chapters to go back in time or to go forward in time instead of doing it every other chapter. I think the biggest problem because Exiled Taya is telling us her childhood origin story. I was super conscious that it was her telling a story and it was her narrating. It's a storytelling trick that usually works really well with movies because it's all visual. Here your imagination is left to roam and you're like, oh wait, she's telling us a story. Or rather, she's not even telling us a story. She's telling the other person in the scene the story. We're just not involved in it at all. So it kind of took me out of getting invested. I feel like with this book, I really enjoyed it, but there was always a but I love the switching POVs, but I love the opening scene, but in this case, I love the world building. It was so flushed out. Everything was created so that you could enter the world seamlessly and believe that this was an established fantasy kingdom, but there was so much info dumping. Not a bad thing. I love info dumps. I love learning about new worlds. I do feel like it wasn't utilized enough. This is something I really notice a lot in fantasy books is that it's world building, world building, world building, and we never really get to experience it. Obviously this is the first book so we could see a lot more of the kingdoms in the second and the third book. In my notes I actually wrote down so this book gets specific and non-specific at times. One instance of it being specific and non-specific all at once is that we knew all about the monarchies, all about the eight kingdoms. Prince Kans, he was a character, a side character in Taya's story. We've seen him a couple of times, we've interacted with him. I was probably halfway through the book and I was like wait I don't even know like is he first in line? Does he have any siblings? What are his duties? Why is he in Ankyo all the time? I get that he's here on a mission, but this mission is really taking a long time. Specific and non-specific at the same time. So that's just one instance that I can think of. And this is something really, really rare that I never ever say when it comes to book reviews because it's hard to execute and there are so many times I've seen it done wrong. But with the amount of world building that went into this book, I felt like it really would have benefited from a multiple POV. Oh, I know, I never say that because it's so hard to do. I like to call this the Mockingjay problem. Most of the Mockingjay book because Katniss was in a bunker and it was first person POV. All we saw was the inside of the bunker when this whole entire world was built outside. So I feel like this book kind of had that problem where it was like, yes, of course we want to see Taya trained to be an Asha, but that means staying in the Ashaka. That means not really getting to see any of the eight kingdoms we've been told so much about. I hope that we will get to see the rest of the eight kingdoms in the second and third book, but I think it would have been a 
also really interesting if we saw this book from the point of view of Taya and Fox, even Taya and Michaela or any of the other Asha. I think it would have been really interesting to see the world from another set of eyes in this book. And while for the most part I really loved the world building in this novel, I think that the weakest part of it was unfortunately the dialogue. I feel like 90% of the characters talked in platitudes. That's fine for the mentor characters, but when even her fellow Asha's in training were using very lofty phrases, very idealistic phrases, they all really spoke in the same voice. And there were also a bunch of anachronisms thrown into the dialogue that really threw me out of this world that she built, like beat the crap or sh It was like up until that point, the world building didn't hint at it being a fantasy kingdom that uses that kind of language. So I was like, beat the crap. That's what you'd hear in high school today, but not in a fantasy world. For the most part, I really enjoyed the author's writing because within a few short words, she's able to like whisk us into her world. That being said, what was the editor of this book doing? There were so many contradictory things, so many typos, so many mistakes. There was one time there is a maid in the Ashaka whose name is Farhi. In one scene, they were like, and even Farsi. So I was like, oh, is Farsi a new character that we're, I don't know who this is. Oh, like you mean the maid. Okay, okay. There was a scene about the Gorvikan horse breeder. So this is an excerpt from the book. The short bandy leg tribes that called the Baron Velt their home bred this steed for war and territory. And people turned to stare at the two men, tall and covered in fur. Like the previous sentence just said they were short. Am I dumb? Because that's how I processed it. It was the short people that bred them and then the breeders went into town and suddenly they were tall. There was a time in the end where Taya was feeling the despair that protagonists usually do at that point in the book. And then she goes to the graveyard. She looks at the grave of death seekers and then her mentor comes up and she was like, don't even think about it. But earlier in the book, it was established that even if you wanted to, you could not raise death seekers or Asha from the grave. So why was Taya in the graveyard in the first place pondering whether or not to raise the death seekers from the grave when earlier it was established that that wasn't even allowed in the canon of the book? Just a lot of scenes like that that I was like, hang on, hang on, did I miss something? I feel like it would have been an easily corrected mistake with the proper like editor. The editor must have been asleep on his or her job. I'm so sorry, but I, that might be like one of the harsher critiques I've had. So I always say I want to do spoiler free reviews and then I come to like the notes at the end of the book and I'm like, oh no, wait, this has to be a spoiler free review, doesn't it? So without further ado, all aboard the spoiler train. Choo choo! This is coming across as I didn't enjoy the book a lot. I did. I just like noticed a lot of things text wise. There were so many drop plot points. She went through all this trouble to raise a horse from the dead. That horse made one cameo towards the end, I think. Leek's story was picked up in the middle, dropped, and then just made a sudden reappearance towards the end of the book. Zoya was built up to be such a big bully and possibly a nemesis of Taya. And in the end, they just sort of like worked together. I guess they made up. Even in the final beat when it was revealed that Aina was actually the other maid. Okay, Taya's telling us the story and she says she saw it coming a mile away, but we weren't included into that. Like we weren't allowed to solve the mystery alongside her. It might be a personal preference thing, but I always like it when mysteries and books are laid out so that you, the reader, can solve it alongside the protagonist. This reveal just really came out of left field. There was no way we could have guessed because we weren't privy to that information that Taya had. And then also like the whole whole entire concept of the faceless leaders were mentioned throughout the book but never really invested enough time or concentration on it. The characters talked about it but didn't really care about it until the end where it turns out the faceless were orchestrating the whole thing. If it turns out that the faceless leader had played such a big part into the finale, why wasn't it brought up more throughout the book? The ending actually, I was just like, okay, just give me the sequel. It was literally a thank you next moment. In the end, it's revealed that Kaylin was the only boy she ever loved and who is now dead and she raised him from the dead and they're off to wreak havoc on the world. Obviously my expectations for the second and third book are to see their love story unfold. I'm really excited about seeing that and I'm really excited to see what the tipping point for Taya was that she turned her back on this entire Ashaka system and I want to see what the reason was for her exile. I think it's just a lot of good stuff in the sequel. I'm really excited. It's called The Heart Forger. The Heart Forger and his apprentice were two of my favorite characters in this whole book so I'm excited. Maybe that means I'll get to see more of them. Now that I'm near Nearing the end of the review, I'm realizing that, oh my gosh, I nitpicked or I had so many issues with so many things. But honestly, I really enjoyed the book. I think the world building alone is enough to carry the weight of all the other issues. Now I'm thinking like, oh no, what if the world building only expands in the sequel and the third book? Will my mind be able to take it? But it will, and it will be epic. I'm sure of that. But that about does it for my The Bone Witch book review. You can
can follow me and my other bookish adventures on Twitter and Instagram. I'm both at cuckoo for books. Please subscribe and I will see you guys very soon. Bye guys. Bye.